we talked about sponsorship being so critical. So the sort of, you know, making sure that the top management team, not, not just is behind the investment that you're going to make and the time you're going to take, but they're, they're going to put all of their support behind making sure that the, that team is successful. So, you know, most groups, most departments will say, well, you know, the higher in the organization I am, the more successful I can be. And I guess in a way that's true. But if you think about if M&A is a real pillar and it's going to drive a core part of the strategy, that's what determines if you're ready for an IMO, which means you need the same level of sponsorship. And so, yeah, I think it goes, it goes part and parcel with M&A is a key part of our strategy. The way that we'll protect the investments in that strategy is governed by the ELT. And the IMO is one of the ways we'll protect that. Welcome to M&A Science, where leading M&A practitioners share lessons learned from their experience. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, visit mascience.com and subscribe to our free newsletter. Every Monday, we share highlights from our interviews and publications so you can continuously improve your M&A skills for free. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science. Joining me today is Ian Burke. EVP of integration at Upland Software. Today, we're going to talk about how to stand up an integration management office. Ian, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks. Good to be here. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for taking the time to do this interview because I know I reached out to you out of the blue. I had a great interview with your colleague, Austin, and we kept plugging in the importance of integration. Your name got dropped a few times and thought, hey, why not see if you'd be up to do an interview? and continue the dialogue so we can get your perspective and maybe uh, give some tips on how Corp Dev could do their job a little better. My pleasure, my pleasure. Austin's a great partner and, um, and you know, we, we start integration planning when diligence happens and every once in a while he calls me right before that. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a great partnership and it's, we've come a long way. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to Austin to do his job better? I have to actually give him or just corp dev people in general. Okay, good. I have to give him credit. I'm, I'm really, he always asks, Hey, for the next one, what do you think we could have done about X or Y? Because I can six months later, I'm going to, I'm going to have definitely unearthed some problems. Um, I really think it's about, you know, thinking about corp dev as a function that just flips things to a team that will go run it. It it works, but um, I would almost think about what's the right way to have your integration team co-author or at least co-pilot your diligence process. And I think you get a different outcome. And I've been really pleased, you know, Austin took that feedback on and um, we rewrote the diligence process a couple of times. Uh, A good example is when we do customer calls, uh, you know, we have multiple people participating. It's not sort of a a banker function or a corp dev function. And so the, the advice is integration is there to protect the investment. Corp dev is there to make the investment. And so you just want, you want both people sort of riding along. That's the best advice. That's it right here. For anybody in Corp Dev listening, one, get feedback from your integration lead, and two, have them jointly collaborate on diligence. Let's kick things off with a little bit about your background. Sure, sure. So um, I've been working about 25 years. Interestingly enough, split about 50-50 now um, in other stuff and M&A related. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I've never would have thought about that, but I'm 36 acquisitions in and interestingly enough about split 50, 50 between my time at Dell where I spent 20 years and at Upland software where I am today. So uh, precisely 36 deals and 18 on each, on each side. Um, interestingly, now I, I think about it, it makes perfect sense with the benefit of hindsight, but in 2009, I was just a, guy with a sales and marketing background that had decided to pivot and, and work on strategy. And as Dell changed, a, you know, changed our focus and thought about inorganic as like a key driver of value, I was in the right place to, to be a part of that. And, and boy, was that a lot of fun. So I like, and now it makes perfect sense. You have an operator sort of sales and marketing background, add on some strategy stints. Of course, that would be an integration person. 
<laughs> right? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a that's a good point there. The question is, what what makes up for a good integration background? It was funny. I remember at the time uh, we we had just started building out as we pivoted and said, "All right, so M and A is going to be a big pillar of how we grow." And I remember this, uh, uh, you know, friend and and uh, mentor said, "Well, you don't know what this is yet, but you're going to be a thing called an integration executive." And I was like, "Okay." Um, and he said that two years prior to that being true. So I thought that was pretty cool. He obviously saw the uh, saw the pattern, but it was so much fun to be thinking about. Like you know, Dell was really strong and still is really strong in the mid market, and so I was on this very small uh, strategy team. Not not so much thinking about traditional matters of strategy, but more um, where the intersection between the go to market and our reach and our distribution could sort of you know have an impact different than. I don't know, out of the book uh, sort of corporate strategy stuff. And that led into, well, what products could we think about with that lens instead of a traditional product market fit? And by the way, what partnerships could we have? And uh, so that was really neat to be a part of it. So that's sort of how I got into M&A. Started out on the deal side as we, we thought about, you know, um, other levers to pull moved into integration and then was on the team that put together the software uh, group for Dell. So that was a entirely inorganic eight acquisition, call it what you want, a platform retrofit um, combination, but slowly put together a, a number of deals and then fully together into a multi-billion dollar business unit. So I was on the team there in the early days and, and had a lot of fun, um, wore a few different hats in that, but ultimately we decided to make that you know, unit uh, reach its full potential that we should spin it out. And so I was there to build it. And I was there when we decided to uh, sell it to private equity back in 2016. And after a little a little time uh, with my family, a little break, which was really, really nice. In 2017, I joined Upland Software, which was uh, a, a scrappy firm of a smaller size, you know, a couple of years after IPO and the entire business model is how to create value through M&A. And I said, well, that is extremely interesting. So that's how I got involved with Upland. Uh, it was a few years back and uh, 18 deals later, um, you know, here we are. <laughs> Do they find you or you find them? Uh, it, well, it's, uh, it's a small network of M&A practitioners. And so uh, I was talking to a few folks. I was doing some consulting and I, I originally was just going to come on and, and, and do some advisory work to help them stand up an IMO. And I was so intrigued, I, I had to join. So uh, I had a connection from, from Dell days, but uh, right, mutually, fair enough. mutually talked ourselves into it. If you know. I, think, I think that's what's interesting about your background is the strategy component, which thinking about that, that really would help well round an integration practitioner, which is uh, what we'll talk about. Maybe we can get into starting off with what's the primary role of the IMO? Sure. I mean, uh, the boring answer is governance. Um, but, you know, the reality is it's, it's, it's um, having seen both sides of it, it's so interesting to be thinking about what's the deal thesis, right? What are the drivers? What are the synergies? Who's going to run it afterwards? What is it going to look like? That's all really, really fun. Um, but a lot of the details are done in the day to day, and so you, the, the the IMO is a shepherd through that process to make sure it's you know the intersection between the strategy and project management, and the the people that are in it. I, you know, I find some of the best IMO practitioners. They can hover up and down, but the work they're doing, even if it seems really granular, it it, it ties to the strategy. And so the idea is a program office that's um, nimble enough and connected enough to the strategy of the firm and understands exactly what you're trying to accomplish and can keep you on the tracks. Um, you know, so governance is the boring answer, but really day-to-day -day management of really important topics. And then a lot of things that are really small that won't matter one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but in aggregate actually sometimes either create or destroy a ton of that. And then probably reporting. Yeah, well, you know, it's really exception management. If you think about it, like if everything is going great, you get your summary and you go, this is nice, it's all green. And the question is, what happens when you have a date slip that has a prerequisite? Uh, what happens if you have a small decision that impacts a value driver? You know, what's the escalation process like where you encourage people to like raise up something you should collectively put your heads together on versus like, 
some some governance might be like, I hope nobody notices, right? I mean, integration management is about like, let's collectively stare at our problems, look at them, talk about them, and then figure a path forward. And if you've got a really nice central group that can do that and create trust and realize, uh, you know, kind of we're all in it together, that's that's a really nice part of the secret sauce. I like how you use the phrase exception management. <laughs> that's well, like I, ideally it runs great. Your dashboard looks good. Your work streams are on track. You're hitting your drivers. You know, it's like, I'm going to take a vacation here a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's, you, know, you think about the depth, the hundreds of items and the hundreds of people that are in play. You really just need to be thinking about how do I break ties? What are my early wor- warning signals and how can I learn from whatever won't go right? Cause it, so, something is going to go not the way you designed it. And the question is, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to react to it? Respond to it. When do you think about building out an IMO? How big do you need to be? Or what sort of things should you have um, in place where you really need to stand up an IMO? I, there's probably a, a hundred opinions on this. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, Upland had done a number of deals before I even showed up. So they were pretty good at it before me. Uh, and really, I joined to help think about how do you do more deals? How do you do them in parallel? How can you do bigger deals with, you know, bigger outcomes? So so it's like, there was not really an IMO before, but there was an integration function. It just happened to be scattered and and maybe not so well thought out. Um, There was not an IMO in the early days of Dell and we were a huge company, you know? And so interestingly enough, through some experience through IBM and GE and a few other practitioners, that team stood up from scratch and IMO that, that pretty quickly got very, very big. And, and a big part of that was how do you go find the right talent? A lot of those people came through the finance track. Um, not unusual to get somebody, you know, either in a rotation or, or somebody that's got, you know, a long list of experience in finance to then move into that's a step closer to operations. But um, I, I think it depends on the, sort of deals you're going to do and how often you're going to do them. It's a lot of work to stand up an IMO. It's even more work to stand one up and then wind it down and then stand it back up and keep repeating that. So I think if M&A is a core part of the strategy, you should have at least a small core team that's evergreen. And then you should be thinking about how you can flex up as the deal activity really, really picks up. And, And one way or another, you want to lean on that next level of folks that are out distributed through the company. And then also who are the third party partners that you can lean on to bring more expertise? I've, you know, I've just worked with so many great uh, consultants and advisors and having a deep bench of those uh, partners also helps you not have to have a sort of IMO on the shelf all the time. Cause that's a, that's a lot of overhead if you're not, if you're not active. So potentially you could outsource it starting out before you really need to build one in house. Yeah, I had never thought of it that way, but I think that's a perfect way to, it's probably the the right way to do it. In fact, I guess I was sort of outsourced. I was brought in as an advisor. You know, we sort of drew out a framework. We talked about a playbook and then I just said, wow, I like this so much. I think I should stay. But I really think getting a couple of key consultants right off the bat is a good, is a good, uh, good way to think about it. I've noticed there are companies that don't quite have a standalone IMO, but they have a central PMO function that maybe is broad and does all these special projects. But then M&A will be part of that and they'll manage the integration. When does an organization like that evolve into standing up their own IMO or does that PMO function work as well? I think it does work. It's it's as long as you're disciplined about how you go after it. A lot of the best practices in running an IMO are, in fact, project management best practices. I think the differentiator is is the experience in the throes of a deal and the deal cycle. Those lessons learned and that scar tissue and and that pattern recognition to sort of see the, you know, see the gotchas before they're coming. And and if you're going to be active enough, it doesn't even have to be large. In fact, maybe one small part of the PMO is dedicated, you know, to integration could, could create a lot of value. I think the overall structure, you can, you can borrow it. In fact, um, I've seen a number of people coming from traditional PMO backgrounds and they step right in and they're so interested in driving process and the rest, they just, they just soak in. And next thing you know, they're like a, a very disciplined IMO person. 
So I think it could be an evolution there. It all just depends on how active you're going to be. And, and the, the more parallel processes you have, the, the more that's at stake. I think the more that dedicated function is really helpful. So you could evolve and actually separate that PMO resources doing M&A and allow them to create their own dedicated function. I think that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, let's get into the steps to set up an IMO. Can you walk me through those? Sure, sure. You know, in uh, Adele, we stood one up in, in early 2000s. Um, and so I got to see some early drafts of it, but really I wasn't an author. I was sort of more of a putting it in play and, and uh, evolving it over time. And my time at Upland was really interesting. I had to go around and basically figure out what was there and then start to evolve the formal structured process. And so the first was go in and listen. Um, and one thing, you know, my, one piece of advice is it's really hard when you say, how do you all think we should do integrations? Nobody has an answer for that. You know, um, what, you know what's the right way to do, you know, whatever this topic is. It, that's a hard question for people to answer. But if you go back and you say, okay, let's talk about some deals that happened. Uh, really helpful if that's true. What was the best thing about that? What was the worst thing? What advice would you give that deal team? Um, if you've never done m and I think it gets a little more tough, but you can use a, a product launch as a proxy. And I find that if you ask people for their advice and what you should put in a playbook, it's tough and you'll never get it, never get it perfect. You essentially want to encapsulate lessons learned and, um, and outcomes, and then try to reverse engineer why that outcome got the way it, it, it was. So in my early days with Upland, uh, I asked a lot of questions and I just asked, you know, let's take me through some of the prior deals, um, you know, and more specifically. So when you were thinking about the product portfolio, who did you gather? How did you do it? And how did you think about it? And at that point I had the benefit of looking at some outcomes. So I was, I was retrofitting. And you, you, the other thing is to find the pockets of real skill that might not, not even know they're, they're gonna be really talented in M&A. So when you ask people, a particular topic, uh, you say, that's great. Sounds like you really rationalized the, the, the roadmap really, really well. Who are the key players in that? And if you click down a couple, you'll find there's some, some next generation leaders that can really thrive in M&A. So that was like, okay, first question is, what outcomes did we have? How does that tie to the results in, you know, in the retrospective that I looked at? And then asking people just in interviews. I just got here. I'm new, I've done a couple of deals before, but tell me about this deal or this process or this person. Um, so I think the first is, is just doing a little bit of a survey and, and, and acting like a consultant the best you can because you won't be able to stand up there. You know, there are some templates and there are some really good frameworks, but the, the key of what it, makes work, what makes it work in your firm comes from a bunch of conversations. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take months doing that, but there is a lot of, you know, looking back in time and asking what the differences were in particular outcomes by topic, in product, in facilities, in sales, uh, and, and, and finding the people that really contributed to that. So I think that's one of the earliest stages is figuring out, okay, what am I going to go do and what might, it, might an outline look like before you even set up a framework? That's kind of early stages. So first step is getting the lessons learned, understanding the outcomes and basically reverse engineering that. So you know how things are done today. It, it, I think it's less about how things are done today. And it's more about, you know, you can look and you can see where you ended up and you, you just try to wiggle through the, how things got there because no one will tell you directly. And it's really even hard for them to think about it that way. Um, so interestingly enough, there was a deal done just a few months before I joined. And so it was in progress. And that was such an interesting, you know, uh, time to be there. So I was spinning up a new one and then I got to watch this and, and I purposely didn't interject a whole lot. I just sort of watched it. Then when I go in and I start doing these interviews, I was getting real live sort of like, I would have done that differently, or I would have thought about this differently. And I used some of that when we, when we stood up the, the framework sort of properly. So what comes after that? What, what's, what comes up next in the process? Uh, ne next would be sort of thinking about who the core team is. And so my preference is to have a very small sort of core IMO team and then think about the project office itself as a pretty distributed function. 
And so um, what's the right archetype? There's a, there's a certain type of person that has that project management bent and, and they, they're excited in the details um, and extremely tenacious and, and want to be part of something truly transformative. Getting that, those few uh, people together making sure they've got the right sponsorship. I think one thing, one discussion with the senior management team that's really critical is how do we make sure that, that staff members that get drafted into the IMO are widely looked at as sort of like, okay, that's, that's a collection of talent right there. And, and how does their leader interface, you know, is making sure you've got sponsorship at the senior level. So we talked about structure and organization, both you know, where the head of the IMO reports and also where the talent comes from. And you definitely want to just show up with a whole staff of people that came from somewhere else. So you want a, a mix of new talent and people that have institutional knowledge and form a core team that will drive the IMO. So I think thinking about that, that, that you know, that core intersection, for me, that's three people that sit at the center that will help manage the larger function. And then you have your next step would be, well, how do I do the alignment? Is it by product? Is it by business unit? Is it by leader? That's, a, that's the next question I'd be thinking about. Once I have my core team, how do they interface with the deal sponsor? And how do you make sure that that relationship is really, really trusty? Start off by finding a leader, ideally a type A person. You can't have, uh, you, you need to have somebody who is ready to drive. Um, it's, it's totally required. There's lots of types of talented people, but I've not met IMO leaders that are bystanders very often. <laughs> and the executive team's got to like them. They have to like them, even when they're delivering bad news or they're having a tough conversation because uh, that honesty, that transparency is going to get you a better deal outcome. So I get a leader. I start from there, build out that core team with some additional in-house external or in-house or new folks. And then what happens? Then the next is I'd start thinking about that extended team. So I like to align, most people do, I think, align by, by department. So you start thinking about who could lead accounting integration, who can lead product integration, who can lead R&D integration. And what, what, um, what I often find is a lead for each one of those departments. They're probably going to have a day job, but somebody who understands as a practitioner what it's like to go drive that outcome, they're going to inherit new team members. Right? That's the person that's going to go co-drive with you. That's your co-pilot with the IMO. So then you start building out a candidate list. And that can be a really large list. And then depending on the deal and where it sits and geography and timing, you draft them in. Uh, and sometimes that drafting would be really quickly. We're like, next Tuesday, we're going to announce a deal. And I'm excited to have you on the team. Um, but I think having those layers of people, because if you're, if you're on a weekend before a deal announced and you don't have your team ready to go, you're going to miss a beat because that hitting the ground running right at day one is really, really critical. So there's that next level of team, which I would just call as like a stable of people that will go help you drive the outcomes. So I'm just talking about like arranging resources and being ready, and then you got to manage it. So from, from there, I think this, this, you know, sounds almost small, but what tool are you going to use or tools are you going to use to drive your integration outcomes? You know, what's the project management tool? What is the governance mechanism? What's the stand-up cadence? You have to think about each of those uh, drivers. And I think setting that, setting that, um, what's the right word? Um, setting that rhythm is a key part of making sure the IMO is successful. And it's going to feel probably like overkill, I think um, I would prefer speed over perfection and I would prefer more people in a meeting than less people in a meeting. And so then you're going to put together, a, you know, for example, a weekly standup to borrow from our development friends, you know, a weekly standup across all functions that you have your IMO lead. And that's like I said earlier, exception management, right? What's on the dock? Where are we heading? What's yellow? What's red? Who needs help? What's that going to be like? And I've said this to many people, it's going to feel like too many people in a meeting to be productive, but you never know because if one or two topics trips um, a, another colleague from another department, that was value created there. And that way you also don't have 16 meetings across the week. So I think that structure and that cadence, you stand them up right off the bat, calendar them out for weeks would be the, the, the next phase. So we covered a couple steps here. We have an extended team where this is where you may be using share resources from a function to 
execute on these integration activities. Maybe as you grow a bit bigger, then you start getting dedicated in the function. Uh, and then also defining your project management approach, including a tool that you may use to enable the collaboration between the parties. And then uh, your essentially like your operating model, defining how your teams are going to work together, share information, conduct meetings, and those fun things. That's right. That's right. I, I think part of that... Um, Part of that process too is what's your management review process. So I'm talking about the IMO standing up a large meeting with all the stakeholders. You're not going to do that every week with the senior leadership team. So often that's a monthly review, exception management. You just have to build out. That's the thing about the IMO is it's, it's often in the process, right? The process will drive clarity in the particular outcome. And so you stand up and make sure that you've got time with the right leaders uh, you know, in the right cadence and they know what to expect when. Uh, that helps you just constantly be looking at what could be going better. After you've gone through a few of these deals and you've got an outline, you've got the structure of the IMO and you've got the cadence and you've got the meeting um, rhythm, then you're going to be driving through your project plan. And so project plan starts out as an outline, but you're going to be constantly feeding back into it. So we're version four of our playbook and the project plan is, is a thousand items deep. And that just comes through time. So after a while, you can onboard new team members a lot more easily. So you're, you're thinking about this as a development opportunity for people. They come in, they do a rotation, they move on, they get promoted. You've got to, you sort of, you know, for the new person, you say, okay, perfect. Let's, let's start here. That playbook process is then going to drive, um, put a little more discipline in the exception management and the tool starts to drive some of that for you. So it sounds trite to be talking about the particular tool, but I really think how you govern it makes a ton of sense. Um, and then, okay, what happens when you, you've got a disagreement or something's not going well, and you've got to make sure that you've got the right sponsorship, not, at the not just at the most senior level of the firm, but also the subject matter experts that are in the, for example, in the business unit that you're working with. And are we clear about, you know, you don't want integration happening to someone, you want integration happening with someone. So I've always found it really important to pair up the acquired team sort of lead and expert with their new uh, sponsor. And that sometimes that's their manager and sometimes it's a coach and sometimes it's a partner. And you should be thinking about that a, a little bit because you have to, how are we going to go? Are we going to, are we going to sell together? Is that team going to sell while we sell? How quickly are we going to talk to customers about our portfolio in an integrated manner, chances are you're not going to have any wins on the actual product roadmap in, in the first few months. So how do we coexist in a way that makes sense for our team and, and for our customers? Um, and, how, and how do we make sure that if you're going to stay a little bit sort of separate, that everyone understands that you're still one team and you don't, and you don't find out 18 months from now, folks say, well, I don't really know. We were operating in the marketplace next to each other, but never really in the same on the same side. I think that's a real, that's a real shame. So I, I like that the two in a box approach and then um, using that as a means to get the go to market alignment. Yeah. I just used, cause you brought it up. I used that example. Um, the, the other, the other thing is the two in a box alignment makes a ton of sense. And everybody has a partner from the acquired company and the sort of acquirer. The other is there's a more informal thing, which is a buddy system. And I'm still struggling to find a better name for it because nobody likes that, but they know what we mean. Um, and that is sort of like, who do I call that's not my new manager? <laughs> who, do we, who do I call that's not my new boss? Or who do I call that's not the IMO to help me a little bit how to navigate through things? And oftentimes that's, that's people in the organization that have a really high EQ. They were often acquired and they can have a little bit of no problem. Give me a call whenever you can. And then the, uh, any other way you could set up an informal listening post, you go back and you pull those folks every once in a while. They're, they're really, really rich sources of, of lessons learned. You know, what, what did you hear and, and what, we, what could we have done better? And oftentimes we find ourselves tweaking just language in like newsletters, for example, based out of some of that feedback. So I didn't mention that, but newsletters is another way. It's not for everybody, but if you work at a firm like ours where M&A is a core part of the strategy and it sort of is the major pillar of the strategy, that communication is so important. And so it's going to come from the leadership. It's going to come from management, but we actually push out an integration digest as well. And it's, 
more information you could ever want to know, but it's, it's sort of published in partnership with that core team that I talked about. And it helps keep the folks that are two or three steps away from that epicenter. It helps keep them really informed. And, uh, and you never know, sometimes you get really good replies and really good engagement from that. But uh, that's another sort of, you know, and maybe that's a blog post or maybe that's intranet or it's a ribbon or whatever it is, but some way to internally kind of work corporate communications to make sure people are, are, uh, are well informed. Because it's, mm-hmm. it's almost like good news is fine and bad news is fine, but not being sure of something is like a killer in deals. And, and so people just don't like this, the silence. And so even if they have a question or they want to they wanna artfully disagree, oftentimes they don't, have a, they don't feel like they have a forum. So the more you push out proactive communication, that's really, that makes it clear, like this is a dialogue. Sometimes you get real gems back in that process. Who reads that? Why? We send it literally to every employee of the new acquired company. Now, you have to think about it at our scale. We're not, these aren't the largest companies. We're talking about, you know, 100 or 200 people. Um, but we track readership. So we track, we track all of that. In fact, it, one of the benefits of owning an email program is I can send internal digests with our own uh, product, which allows me to see what the engagement rates are and find out if, you know, tweak the content and make sure that it's getting looked at. Not everybody has that lever, I understand, but, but yeah, it's, it really goes out to the entire team and it's, it, it, it keeps you from having an all hands meeting every other week, which after a while people start to, I mean, I, you had a good point about keeping people to know good or bad. As long as then they're no, they can handle it. It's when they don't know is when they freak out. People so. want to, yeah, they want to be involved. They want to be involved. Even if the decision isn't theirs, uh, they want, they want to be involved. And so it's about a lot of communication flow. This is not for everyone, but another thing to be thought about is is uh, the overlap in your deals. And so if you know you're going to have two deals happen in short succession, that has a different integration plan, an IMO plan, versus if you could space them out. The unfortunate part about deal cycles is they're unpredictable. So sometimes you'll end up two deals on top of each other or a, a wide gap in between. And so back to that topic of like having the stable of people, be thinking about sort of how those how those communication cadences lay into each other. And if you've, if you've got to do two deals in succession, is your stable big enough? Um, and, and how do you manage through that process? That was one thing I wanted to mention. Can we talk more about broader best practices for integration? Like how do you structure your playbooks? Sure. Um, one, one thing we've arrived on is uh, what we call the integration commandments. And so we, we have a set of, you know, always do, never do, try to avoid that, T- tend to be pretty firm specific, but, but, but they're the, the things that matter most. And then we ask each of the chapter owners, each of the department leads to author their own commitments. Now, to be fair, they don't all have 10, um, but there's a few of those, right? So you just be thinking about, um, I don't want to be absolute, but I think there should be a few you should always and you should never. And it's hard for me to, they're not going to be for everybody, but, but over the first few months of the firm, we authored a couple. And I think having those guardrails is really important as a, as a, as a signpost. Oftentimes they're, they're a connection to the financial outcome or they're a connection to key talent. So you think about, you know, how you're going to manage the key people that you know are going to drive value in this particular business for you, right? How, how do you have the right steps to assess that they've got a role and a scope and a decision-making whatever remit that is in line with what they want to do to do their best work. And so you should never come in and say, Hey, congratulations. It's your first day at the new company and here's your new title. You should, there's a nuanced way to go do that. So it's a, it's a bad example, but titles are, titles are really sensitive to people. And by definition, if you're coming into a larger firm, there's going to be a title releveling and there's a smart way to do that. There's not going to be seven CFOs at the firm, but there's a way to go through that. So we ask people to never be cavalier about job roles and job scopes. And so that's part of the HR chapter. Um, and, and the other is making sure that the right people are having the right conversations or, or people fill in the gap, you know, as I mentioned, you know, good news is fine. Bad news is fine. Indifference or not knowing is really the, the, the killer for folks. So a lot of this is, basically defining the operating model with some commandments of here's how we operate. Here's what to do, not to do and some general thinking to help people get uh, aligned. 
That's right. I mean, that's all it is. I mean, the IMO is just a giant alignment machine. And so to the extent you can get everyone in the company to write down exactly what good looks like in their department, you don't need one. But extracting that and pulling it out is really, is really tough. And we have a few departments. I mean, talking about you know, answering the bell, they did an outstanding job. We said, let's, let's line out the do's and don'ts and things that matter to you most. And they went all the way down to what's called desk procedures. It's like, you're brand new. You just started. This is all the things that you do in your job. It's incredible. Those end up being you know, amendments to the playbook chapter. But that's really extra credit. I mean, that's not for everybody. What happens when you pull in someone who hasn't done m a Does your playbook help them get up to speed? It does. If, you, if you've authored it right, it's been helpful for us. I mean, a very common track here is you'll be acquired and then later you'll be the acquirer. And so if your experience was only what happened when you came on and who knows when that happened, the reminder of the task list is really, really helpful. So you, you remember the context, you've got the task list and now you're part of the team. That's a really exciting thing. It's a cool evolution. Uh, for, for people. But yeah, if we just bring somebody that's fresh to the company, I can think of a few examples in our communications team. So we hired a few new team members in communications and they immediately got to look through the comms playbook. And that starts from, we walk through the messaging with the CEO of the acquired company before the deal's announced. We co-author an email, here's where your quote would go. Uh, and it's actually built out minute by minute on the first day. So the, com- the comms flow of exactly what message goes through what vehicle and in what order that we were able to just, you know, take her right through that. And right off the bat, like a couple of weeks later, she was, she was on a deal and she did a great job. So we have defining this operating way of working. We have um, the, the documents to help people really get up to speed on uh, the way they do things. What about like the real nitty gritty to-do list, KPIs and things like that? The nitty gritty is just honed over time. The thousand plus that I, that I mentioned, I mean, that, that's when a great project manager is going to get it done for you. And it is just a, a task list. So, you know, if, you're, if your playbook is just a task list, you're probably doing it wrong, but you have to have the task list to support the things that create a lot more value. And the work streams are the departments that have the most success. They put somebody on that as a day job, right? Their entire job is to be thinking about that to-do list. And sometimes it's really small. I mean, I'll use a great example. Like you have to redirect the mail. There are, there are clients even in 2022 that still send you a physical check. And so you've got to make sure that it's going to the right place because the bank accounts are going to change. And so that's on somebody's list. And it's probably not going to be the VP of finance. And so somebody has got to make sure that gets done. And there's hundreds of examples like that. But those that have a dedicated department lead, they don't miss those, you know. How long does it take to stand up an IMO? I think um, a, a few months. It doesn't need to be a super protracted amount. I mean, if you wait for it to be perfection, you'll, you'll, you'll never quite get it. So you just need the outline and you, have to, you had to, have to get it running. But I think a few months, if you've got somebody that's really done it before. If you're dealing with a project management office, like we talked about, may, maybe a little bit maybe a little bit longer, but I think from my first days consulting to deal time, we're talking about a few months. What happens is you start to scale and you have multiple integrations going on at once. Yeah. We just tell, tell the deal team to slow it down, right? That works perfectly. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, actually, that's, a, that's a, just pump the brakes real quick. And... <laughs> it's a real pressure. I mean, we, we, as we think about some deals, they drag on a little bit. And so we're, we're constantly trying to orchestrate. Um, but oftentimes we'll think about like one of our large milestones is when key systems cut over. So a good example is we run one instance of Salesforce for the entire company. It's an important way to make sure that all of our sort of client accounts are aligned. And also every sales team can see all the history, all the notes and, and whatever you know, sort of customer has. And so part of the promise for them is, you know, you've got clients that have already tried at least one of our products. They're familiar. It's happy hunting. Um, so there's a single instance, but that's, that's a big deal uh, to move a, a CRM instance into ours. And so we rally a bunch of activity right around that particular milestone. And we did the same thing for NetSuite and the same thing for our Jira stack. And there's a lot of key tools. And so the question would be, okay, if we had to do them at roughly the same time or within a month of each other, would you change it? Would you do anything differently? And oftentimes we'll pull one milestone up and push another back. 
um, because it's the same core team that's actually executing that. But, but you have to have the playbook and you have to have the calendar to be thinking about those dates. And so for us, I know that Salesforce is typically cut over in month four. And so I, then I think about my deal cycle and trying to get 80 to 90% of the work done in the first 90 days. I know when that cutover is going to happen, you can lay those calendars on top of each other and start looking for the, the problem spots. It's a balancing act. Always, always. So I want to back up to the early stages when we first decide to do an IMO. Who's involved? Is that all like a C-suite decision? Where's that thinking evolve? And then like, what are some of those early steps that, that happen from that initial thinking? Definitely, it's an executive leadership team, ELT level discussion. Um, in, in the few that I've been involved in, it was, it was a sort of ELT sponsored decision that went to the board to make sure they understood what was involved and everybody was on board. We talked about sponsorship being so critical. So the sort of, you know, making sure that the top management team, not, not just is behind the investment that you're going to make and the time you're going to take, but they're they're going to put all of their support behind making sure that the, that team is successful. So, you know, most groups, most departments will say, well, you know, the higher in the organization I am, the more successful I can be. And I guess in a way that's true. But if you think about if M&A is a real pillar and it's going to drive a core part of the strategy, that's what determines if you're ready for an IMO, which means you need the same level of sponsorship. And so, yeah, I think it goes, it goes part and parcel with, M&A is a key part of our strategy. The way that we'll protect the investments in that strategy is governed by the ELT. And the IMO is one of the ways we'll protect that value. When do these executives give in? Do they look at their th results and saying, hey, we're not getting the value that we anticipated on these deals or our shareholders are really kicking hard for us to produce better results? Like, What, what ultimately drives them to saying it's time to set up an IMO? I think it's more, it's, it's, Time to do M and A, uh, because you know many firms it's it's sort of infrequent. It's not a core. It's not a cornerstone of the strategy. It's one of many levers they have. I think when M and A becomes a cornerstone of the strategy, then you say, "Great, what's the appropriate investment that I have to go make?" Um, it'd be hard for me to think about how the board would get a signal that it's the IMO time. But it's sort of like if M and A is a cornerstone of the strategy, we're going to go invest uh, millions and billions of dollars to go do this. We'll, what would be a what would be an easy investment to go make to protect that? You know, when I frame it that way, it's like, of course, we need an IMO. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. I just seen it time after time where there wasn't a big investment in how things are integrated, and just uh, high failure rate, integration failed. Why we didn't plan it early enough? We didn't have the right people in the right seats. I don't know. That's no, why I, I was curious if there's more of this big failure that prompts, hey, let's really start investing in our integration function. Yeah, no, I, I got it. Um, interestingly enough, you know, people are great at, at M&A once they've tried it and did it poorly. <laughs> but I think, um, I think that, that that is a good way to look at it. The issue is, is how will M&A, how will the strategy drive M&A? And if you're not immediately saying, what's the right level of governance? What's board level governance for m and I think that's maybe part of the issue. Maybe what, what you're thinking about is if at the sort of deal process is pushed too far down in the organization, you're almost setting yourself up for a bad outcome. And some of the best practitioners, you hear, you hear them say things like, well, deals are sponsored in the CEO's office. It's impossible to mistake the importance or... Um, you know, an ELT member not only has to be the champion of a particular deal, but they're responsible for those results as well. When it, when it makes the list of the top four or five things that a top leader will do in a year, then, then you start to get the right level of intensity and, and you have to be thinking about it proactively. So if it's, hopefully if it's on that agenda, if it's met, if it's made it to the board agenda, the question is, how do we how do we protect ourselves? Because really, it's an insurance policy to make sure that you protect your outcomes. And after the fact is, yeah, a little late, a little late. That's helpful. That'll help somebody out there sell it to their board. No, it's it's really good. I mean, oh, it's it's so, I'm I, I'm in an environment my entire M and A career where 
that, that was a pivotal part of the strategy. And so it was like, of, of course, you're going to think about it this way. But how do you know that's true before it happens? I think that's the, that's the board level and the ELT level decision is. And, and don't stand it up from scratch. You need somebody who's been through it. So hire a, a trusted consultant, hire somebody as an advisor, and just maybe just walk through those steps. How prepared are we to build a core team? Once you get the core team and, and the right sponsorship, you can, you can probably figure the rest out. Okay. So we'll run through the steps real quick of setting up an IMO and make sure I didn't miss anything. Step one, understand the outcomes and then work your way backwards. Uh, we talked about understanding or identifying who's in charge, getting that type A person that the business executives like, building out your core team. Then we have your extended team because you may be sharing some resources within the functions building out your operating model really you in for you a playbook goes beyond a checklist it's defining how your teams are going to share information how they're going to work together conduct meetings manage dependencies the tools they're going to use uh, and then from there we review process i wrote something like that review process with leads uh and then with the playbook part of it was defining like the exception management. Yeah, that's true. So, so the governance is the meeting cadence with the integration leads. That's where the exception management happens. So that's when your IMO is up and running. Okay. But so, so the, the next step would be really flushing out the governance for your exception management. And then um, we talked about some of your approaches, like using the two in a box model for um, helping with the companies that you're bringing in and also to get better go to market alignment with your different uh, sales teams. Using two in a box to help your target acquisition employees get better acquainted in the new company and also help the different functions align better around their go to market. Well, it's like each of the, the two in a box helps get co-authored solutions instead of it feeling sort of like heavy handed. And it happens across all the departments. But a consequence is your go to market team will be way more aligned because they'll have a joint outcome for product, sales, marketing, et cetera. It'll feel a lot more cohesive in the marketplace. That makes a lot, a lot of sense. What else? Is there anything else I'm missing? Does that cover most of the steps? It does. Right, right before you sign an LOI, you should tell the buyer not to enter into a new long-term lease. <laughs> there's, there's your tip. There's your best practice. Well, let's get, let's get into the best practices. <laughs> I, I, I want to, I want to start with how does this evolve? Can you walk me through that? Because there's companies out there that are going to stand up their MA function, then it turns into now what? And here at MA Science, we always talk about agile and how do you be agile? Uh, and never settle, continuously improve. So how, how would one go about assuring that their IMO function would properly evolve? Part of that for us is making sure that there's a, a cycle. And so there's a few different informal, I mentioned listening posts, but in each department, we do a, a sort of end of integration review. We go back to that same team and we basically ask what went best what didn't go well. And we're asking the acquired leader in that particular department. So a giant source for us of lessons learned, which all get folded back into the playbook are these debriefs. And they're done in very small forums. They're done, you know, a great example would be the integration lead for project man for product management and the product manage, you know, the product management director or VP at the acquired company, plus the IMO listening in, right? what went well, what didn't, what would you do differently? We do that across all of the work streams. So there's a huge, that, that's oftentimes we find where there's, there was gold that we missed it. So that closed loop is a, it's one of the reasons why the task list has gotten so long is there's a ton of those lessons learned. We take those that are really meaningful or really impactful and we put them on a slide called stub toes that we show to each new team as they're acquired. So we obviously can't say, here's all the things that we've done wrong over the years. Um, but really, here's some things that are top of mind and fresh of mind. Um, and we also explain the playbook. I think a big part of continuous improvement is, is signaling really strongly 
that you want to learn and then you're open to it. And so we describe uh, typically on the second day, sometimes the fourth day after a company is acquired, we hold a session with them and we say, what do we mean by integration? And we actually describe some of what we've just done. So here's, here's who's going to do what. Here's the two in a boxes. These are all names that you know and recognize. Um, and so this is how they're going to work together. Every week we're going to get together and we're going to run exception management. If you've got a question, here's who you can go to. That almost just describing the discipline in which we're going to go integrate is a big part of it. So then when you go out to your listening posts and we hold those sessions or we send a survey or we do some of the other things I talked about, they sort of understand there's a bit of humanization on the other end of that. And we get a lot of, a lot of our gold and that's always got to be folded back in. And then in our monthly executive integration review, we'll float any of those lessons that are needy up to the top team to make sure we can have a dialogue. Going. That learning retention model justifies standing up an IMO function right there. Uh, I'd like to think it's, it's been pretty helpful. It, sometimes it's a little bit depressing. You look at all the things you're like, boy, I would have done that differently. But you know, the reality is every deal you get, you get better and you learn something. And if you didn't learn something, you, you probably didn't have to ask enough questions. I mean, it's a, it's what, an interesting process. What's like a harder thing to do in corporate America than integrate a company? I mean, uh, obviously there's <laughs> some size to it, but you do a large integration. It's the largest magnitude of change management that organization is going to go through. I'm obviously biased, but it's, it's truly disruptive and it's incredible for people that are excited for the, for the battle. But but if it's if learning and constantly figuring things out is not interesting, it's it's not for everyone. But not I, I love it. And the team that we work with, I mean, the idea that they put their fingerprints on something that creates long, meaningful value that that's tied to a big check the company uh, wrote is is really helpful. But the exposure they get to how companies run is incredible. And so you find over time, people that have been doing integration, they can go on a wide range of topics, right? They can talk about, you know dev team cycles, they can talk about lease management, they can talk about ARR and calculations. I mean, the amount of, the amount of ta tax tips and tricks that I've picked up just through osmosis over the years is probably, probably numerous. Cool. Um, it's like a CEO, but you actually do work. <laughs> uh, let's jump in. Let's get into what are your top lessons learned along the way? I have such a hard time. I mean, that's like, I'm, there's thousands of them. It's, it, I have a hard time really f floating them up. I think um, the macro lessons learned for sure are, there's a lot of value in telling people what you're going to go do, describing a process so that there's some, something to fill the void. And I just, I encourage everybody to put yourselves in the shoes of an acquired company employee their whole perspective just changed and maybe they just found out about it that morning. And so sometimes silence is really tough. And maybe their CEO is the one that came in that morning before the team showed up and packed their boxes and isn't to be seen again. You don't really know what they're going through. So I think the just over communicating and telling people, again, you know, just telegraphing, right? So speed over perfection. We're a learning organization. We're not going to get it right. But if you don't tell us how we can do better, then you own in that outcome with us. Just sort of really sharing your tenants and sharing what you're about. I mean, a question we get all the time is what's the culture like? Well, the culture is whatever we go build together. And when you do as many deals as we do, the culture sometimes is, is region or BU specific. And so let's go define it. Let's go figure it out. So we just, we're just sort of over communicating. So my my biggest lesson is assume that you're going to get it wrong and over communicate, tell people what to expect and make sure you follow through, which feels not like integration best practices, but more just sort of like some good advice. But a lot of lessons learned come out of not doing that or assuming that someone else was handling it. You should, you should not assume. You should not assume. I like that. If you can uh, keep, a people focus and also a feedback loop inviting them to create transparency in return. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any other really good um, lessons learned. Um, one is around financial metrics. So I think you should define terms that you use often. And so it sounds really simple, but I've heard profit uh, defined a lot of different ways, depending on the way the firm was run that you acquired. And, and sometimes we're talking about smaller firms or 
you know, maybe 100% of the equity was owned by, a, you know, two people. And so th 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 there was no participation for the team. So when you start coming and you talk about, all right, top, top KPIs here, organic growth, retention, churn, sales and marketing as a percent of revenue, EBITDA, you might've lost half the room. So defining those topics and making sure you're not talking about something that's not relevant, probably sounds small, but I think goes a long way. Really good point. And what's the craziest thing you've seen in M&A? <laughs> okay, so in this deal, the CEO drove to the office at 7 a.m. before the team showed up to go do the welcome to the company uh, presentation and boxed everything up and, and, and was never seen again. Um, and so the team that was on site was left to answer, you know, what happened to so-and-so. And that, that's, that's, that's pretty wild. Um, so he had a CEO just disappear. Basically on the first day they were supposed to welcome the, the, I mean, was it announcing the transaction and welcoming or? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It, it was on the day. So the news, the news broke and that was it. Um, that that's 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 pretty wild, um, I, you know. I, while this thing, th this is more of a positive. I mean, there are all sorts of like I can't believe that person did that, but I'll I'll probably not share them all here. But you know, we had one founder who d didn't bring up you know the 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 um, the funds flow, the equity flow was really straightforward, and and so the transaction was really smooth, and never mentioned to us. But we actually found out from an employee that. Uh, this CEO, this founder cut personal checks to the employees after the deal closed as a thank you gift. Um, and that was, that was so, that was so neat. It wasn't, it wasn't for the credit. It wasn't for any of that. It was, it was, you know, thanks for everything you've done for me. It was not about, you know, did Upland calculate the funds flow properly? I thought that was really cool. And then another time we spent, maybe my last wild thing is hours, perhaps talking about whether or not the gas in an Aston Martin was a benefit. So, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> was it? <laughs> <clears throat> no, no. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the time. I enjoyed this conversation and learned a lot. Thanks, Kisan. Really enjoyed the, uh, really enjoyed the chat. Cheers. Here's to the deal. <laughs>